Hi, it's Sue. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading. It is for May 7th, and I'm reading 1 Chronicles 18 to 21. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and took Gath and its towns out of the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab, and the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. David defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, to Hamath, as he went to establish his dominion by the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, and 20,000 footmen, and David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but reserved of them enough for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David struck 22,000 men of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David, and brought tribute to Yahweh. Gave, oh, and brought tribute. Yahweh gave victory to David wherever he went. David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. From Tibath and from Kun, cities of Hadadezer, David took very much bronze, with which Solomon made the bronze sea, the pillars, and the vessels of bronze. When Tu, king of Hamath, heard that David had struck all the army of Hadadezer, king of Zobah, he sent Hadoram his son to King David to greet him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and struck him. For Hadadezer had wars with two, T-O-U, and he had with him all kinds of vessels of gold and silver and bronze. King David also dedicated these to Yahweh with the silver and with the gold that he carried away from all the nations, from Edom, from Moab, from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, and from Amalek. A listener brought up a really great point the other day, and I love it. It's just an interesting and precious tidbit to me now. So thank you to whoever brought this up. That is that among the kings of Israel, David stood out for a specific purpose. And that is that he never turned away from God to any other gods or idols. And when it says that David had a heart after God's, um, you know, I knew that, and I knew David was righteous, and that he had he had made mistakes, and he sinned with Bathsheba, and had Uriah the Hittite. It was Uriah, right? I hate it when I start talking off the cuff, and then I I um, second guess some of the names. <laughs> you know, usually when people preach, they double check these things before they go blurt them out. But anyway, um, most Bible readers know the story. So the whole point of this is that even though David sinned, his heart was never turned away from God to an idol. That's a huge point. Other kings sinned, even Solomon sinned, but they also turned their hearts away to worship other gods. David never did. To my knowledge, he never did. And that was such a good point to bring out. I think that's part of the key of David. You know, David had a relationship with God. He had a relationship that really superseded the law. It kind of goes along with when Jesus said, was the Sabbath made for man or man for the Sabbath? You know, this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And, and uh, oh, how do I say that without going into a big dissertation? Um, David's heart toward God, his heart of repentance, his, his heart to please God, his worship of God, his intimacy of God really saved him. I believe that is the key of David and this fact that he never worshipped any other God, only God alone. So it it overcame by the grace of God, his weak, his human weakness and his sin. Same way it does for us. It's like David had this new covenant relationship with God way before the new covenant was made. It's it's an interesting concept. It's that part is not new. It's been it's been delved into before. You can find writings and commentary about it. But I just thought that part about David, even though he sinned, he never turned his heart away, away from God. I think that is just so fabulous. Verse 12. Moreover, Abishad, the son of Zeruiah, struck 18,000 of the Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons, garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became servants to David. Yahweh gave victory to David wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, and he executed justice and righteousness for all his people. 
Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. Shavshah was scribe, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and the sons of David were chief officials serving the king. So you see, as David's establishing his righteousness, I mean, his kingdom, he, it says he's executing justice and righteousness. So what happens is, oh, let me rephrase that. It says he executed justice and righteousness for all his people. So what happens is he's garnering favor with people. You know, long live the king. When you have a righteous king, you want them to be there as long as possible. He's becoming a populous president, so to speak. He's he's um, gaining favor and alliances with kingdoms around him. Um, even the ones that are serving him, the ones that are smart, they're gladly serving him. You know, it says that they were, he, he brought certain ones under servitude. Well, in many ways, I'm sure for a lot of them, that was an improvement in their life. They weren't just, um, if he's ruling, executing justice and righteousness for all people, that means he's even treating the slaves well. He's doing his best for them. He's setting up an economy where it works for everyone. So the Bible says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, they mourn. So David was a good example of a righteous leader in spite of his flaws. 19.1. After this, Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his place. Um, David said, I will show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon to Hanun to comfort him. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanun, Do you think that David honors your father in that he has sent comforters to you? Haven't his servants come to you to search, to overthrow, and to spy out the land? See how the devil comes to whisper accusations and and doubt and suspicion in the ears of people to set them at odds with each other? That says, so he said, So Hanan took David's servants, shaved them, cut off their garments in the middle of their buttocks, and sent them away. Then some people went and told David how the men were treated. He sent to meet them, for the men were greatly humiliated. The king said, Stay at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. When the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanun and the children of Ammon sent 1,000 talents of silver. Let's see what that is, since I'm reading off my phone. A talent is about 30 kilograms, or 66 pounds. So 1,000 talents, it says, is 30 metric tons. Wow. So he sent sent all this silver to hire chariots and horsemen out of Mesopotamia, out of Aram Makkah, and out of Zobah. So they hired for themselves 32,000 chariots and the king of Makkah with his people who came and encamped near Mediba. Now, I remember talking about this last year when we read through this. Um, these are little, literally hired warriors, like contractors. Isn't that amazing? People hired to come in and and be a mob. Um, the children of Ammon gathered themselves together from the cities and came to battle. When David heard of it, he sent Joab with all the army of the mighty men. The children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the gate of the city, and the kings who had come were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him before and behind, he chose some of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. The rest of the people he committed into the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they put themselves in array against the children of Ammon. He said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you are to help me. But if the children of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be courageous and let's be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. May Yahweh do that which seems good to him. So Joab and the people who were with him came near to the front of the Syrians to the battle and they fled before him. When the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians had fled, they likewise fled before Abishai, his brother, and entered into the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. When the Syrians saw that they were defeated by Israel and sent messengers and called out the Syrians who were beyond the river, with Shophatch, the captain of the army of Hadadezer, leading them. David was told that, was told that, so he gathered all Israel together, passed over the Jordan, and came to them, and set the battle in array against them. So when David had put the battle in array against the Syrians, they fought with him. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David killed of the Syrian men 7,000 chariots and 40,000 footmen, 
and also killed Shapach, the captain of the army. When the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and served him. The Syrians would not help the children of Ammon anymore. At the time of the return of the year, at the time when kings go out, Joab led out the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Ribah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Joab struck Rabbah and overthrew it. David took the crown of their king from off his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold, and there were precious stones in it. It was set on David's head, and he brought very much plunder out of the city. He brought out of the out the people who were in it and had them cut with saws and iron picks and axes. David did so to all the cities of the children of Ammon. Then David said to the people, uh, then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. After this war arose at Gezer with the Philistines, then Sibachai the Hushethite killed Sippai of the sons of the giant, and they were subdued. So let's make a note. Those were giants that they were goring up. Again, there was war with the Philistines, and Elhanan, the son of Jair, killed Lam Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again war at Gath where there was a man of great stature who had 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was born to the giant. When he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So these weren't ordinary people. These were giants. They were terrorizing monsters okay 21 verse 1 satan stood up against israel and moved david to take a census of israel david said to joab and to the princes of the people go count israel from beersheba even to dan and bring me word that i may know how many there are joab said may yahweh make his people a hundred times as many as they are but my lord the king aren't they all my lord's servants why does my lord require this thing why will he be a cause of guilt to israel Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave up the sum of the senses of all the people to David. All those of Israel were 1,100,000 men who drew a sword. And in Judah were 470,000 men who drew a sword. But he didn't count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. So Joab did a halfway job because he didn't want to do it in the first place. God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he struck Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now put away, I beg you, the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now, this seems funny. You ask, you know, why did David do it when he knew it was wrong? Um, my suspicion, I haven't studied this out. I think I've heard a few messages about it. A lot of times when it seems incongruent it's it's in the translation if you go do the word searches look up the true meaning of what's going on it, it usually will become clear so there's a, a study somebody can do um yahweh spoke to god david seer saying go and speak to david saying yahweh says i offer you three things choose one of them that i may do it so god came to david and said to him yahweh says take your choice either three years of famine or three months be consumed before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of sword of Yahweh, even pestilence in the land, and Yahweh's angel destroying throughout the borders of Israel. Therefore, uh, now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to God, I am in distress. Let me fall, I pray, into Yahweh's hand, for his mercies are very great. Don't let me fall into man's hand. So Yahweh sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. As he was about to destroy it, Yahweh saw, and he relented of the disaster and said to the destroying angel, It is enough, now withdraw your hand. Yahweh's angel was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. David lifted up his eyes and saw Yahweh's angel standing between earth and the sky, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. David said to God, Isn't it I who commanded the people to be counted? It is even I who have sinned and done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Yahweh, my God, be against me and against my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Then Yahweh's angel commanded Gad to tell David that David should go up and raise an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Orn and the Jebusite. David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spoke in Yahweh's name. 
Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Give me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar to Yahweh on it. You shall sell it to me for the full price that the plague may be stopped from afflicting the people. Ornan said to David, Take it for yourself and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Behold, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing instruments for wood and the wheat for the meal offering. I give it all. King David said to Ornan, No, but I will most certainly buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is yours for Yahweh, nor offer a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David gave to Ornan 600 shekels of gold. Let's see how much those are. The shekel is about 10 grams or 0.32 or troy ounces. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. So he gave him 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. David built an altar to Yahweh there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on Yahweh and he answered him from the sky. Oh, sorry, he answered him from the sky by fire on an altar of burnt offering. Then Yahweh commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into its sheath. At that time, when David saw that Yahweh had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For Yahweh's tabernacle, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high place of Gibeon. But David couldn't go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid because of the sword of Yahweh's angel. That's it for today's reading. Thanks for joining me. Shalom, shalom.